All right, everybody doing good? Thank you for joining. So I'm Mark Dickerson, VP of Cloud Delivery and Operations for Technicolor. And what I'm going to do today is sort of share with you uh, the last year of my life that I've endured while being at Technicolor and, and moving us into this monolithic transformation that we've sort of gone through and this journey that we all talk about the cloud. OK. So a few things. Um, this is the single largest transformation in 30 years. If you look at all the, the publications that have been done, it's not just M&E. It's every enterprise. It's enterprise as a service, if you think about it. And that's really what we're facing here, is that this is a monolithic change when you think about the disruption that this brings to our industry and all the verticals that Technicolor operates in. And, and why I say that is that there's no way that we as an organization, much less any enterprise, would be able to scale out. There was a study we did three years ago, roughly, before I joined Technicolor, uh, that, that sort of looked at our compute and storage growth. And if we looked at it long range over 10 years, it would be 100x. And someone said to me that Moore's Law wouldn't even save us. And they're absolutely right. There was no way we could continue the path that we were on the journey at that time. And we needed ways to get past these industry hurdles and these problems that we were starting to see years ago. And it, if I just backed up and said, just so we all are aware, the cloud's been around since 1950. If you think about the theory of sharing and mainframes and screen scraping, we've been in this model for the last 65 years. People just, what happened was a few years ago in 2008, uh, people started coining the term cloud. And it was actually coined by a professor in 1997 and then brought forth by the marketplace by some really smart business people 11 years later. And now here we are. And we all talk about the cloud. And, and I think that when you think about that, you say to yourself, Wow, 65 years, why are we thinking about security? We drive in cars today that could be hacked into in 30 seconds. Who owns a BMW or Mercedes, Porsche? You guys have money. I know you have one. Okay, In 15 seconds, a Chinese group hacked into a BMW 7 Series. They were able to do everything in that car except put it in drive. You trust your families in your automobile like that, but we don't trust cloud. We don't trust somebody else's facility. That doesn't add up to us. So we had to figure out ways to get through that. And we had to find ways to do it in a least disruptive process. So really what we wanted to do was we needed to make machines smarter. And we had to put logic in our machines, in our machine language, so that we could automate outcomes rather than guessing, right? We don't want to cross our fingers. We want a predictable and reliable outcomes. And, it, and when I think about it's not an evolution, it's a revolution. And, and really, we as an organization use our model that I'll show, share with you in a minute as how we use them for building blocks for our next generation of release. And then optimizing our workforce. If you think about, we can't keep hiring people as we scale out. We have to find ways to interject automation and orchestration to fulfill our team members. Right? Think about how I can take something in the middle, slice it out, and deliver an automation and orchestrated model that gives me predictable results. I think everybody would agree that's what they're looking for. And then obviously, the last thing is that we wanted to stop selling things. We wanted to actually sell results. And that was the kind of premise that we went forward on this. And so people say, well, how did you do this? Well, it was a lot of pain, I'll tell you that. A lot of plane rides, a couple hundred thousand miles in a year, um, a small group of people. Um, and it was relationships. And you'll see in the slide later, it's 90% of everything we do is all relationship building. It's bridging the gap, if you will. The technology stack is easy. It's easy to do this stuff if you have the right people and surround yourself with people that know things you don't know. But you need the business relationship to have the executive sponsorship to make it work. And what happened to us is that it required us to sort of change our organizational structure and our technology footprint and th rethink geographically and holistically how we, were, how we were doing things, especially around our people. People are our biggest assets, right? They, they have to be. If you think about people and don't treat them like that, then you're not going to get the outcome out of them that you want. So we had to invest in our people and transform our people. And then when we couldn't do that quickly enough, we had to buy insurance plans. So we partnered with vendors to provide us the steroid injection, if you will, to get us moving. And then last but not least, you know, I was in Marines for 10 years. So I did four tours of combat, improvise, adapt, and overcome. That's our motto. We go really fast, but we go secure and quick. And we really need to adopt that as a model moving forward. Everybody asks, is cloud cheaper? And I will tell you no. Why? Well, because that's a general term. Maybe a piece of a workflow or an abstraction of your pipeline is cheaper. And if you break apart the bits and move them where they need to be, then yes, they are. So we set clear milestones and elements and how we were going to do this. So we built analytic engines on top of our models that I'll show in a second around our cloud, cloud agnostic strategy that allows us to see analytics at any point in time. You can go to Amazon or Google and use your billing engine or SoftLayer or Azure, et cetera. The problem with that, it's a reactionary bill. It's estimated. It's not point in time. It doesn't give you that 
price you need at that moment, given moment. So we built engine on top of that that gives us that information. And it's automated. So therefore, our financiers can look at a job. They can drill down into a piece of a pipeline, down to the job, down to a tool, and see what that tool is costing us to deliver on premise or in a provider's network. And last but not least, obviously, our automated invoicing model. Everybody said, well, we use allocations. Well, <laughs> that's not going to work in this model. We built an automated engine that allows us to ingest from our cloud providers directly into ServiceNow. We suck that into our SAP platform, and the invoice is generated to our tenants, just like it would a third party. So now it's treated differently. And now people can actually see what things are costing them just in time, and they can actually forecast out. What does it cost me on premise for metal? What does my virtualization cost on premise? What is it going to cost me to put something in Google or in Amazon? And I can see that holistically from a single pane of glass today. The technological transform that I talked about, if you think about this chart, at one point in time, this was just one big box, and everybody was in this box. They were just, everybody was doing all different activities. What we did is we sort of split five pillars, and we created a whole new model called tenant engagement. And what that means is that we have a small SME of people that go out and actually do pre-sales and sales engineering and relationship building. And then we have a pipeline that builds that onto our enterprise architecture team, which actually had to transform themselves into a new thing of thinking and be sort of the thought leaders of, of how we were going to drive this engine moving forward. Security, huge, very near and dear to us. You'll see a chart later on that talks about security as far as what we feel about that, meaning that it's actually costing us more time and effort right now today in security than it was on premise. And the reason for that is, is that there's so much turmoil in, into security around what secure cloud really means. Um, internet access, private cloud, I mean, those things are all marketing terms. For us, it really means that we need to have a fine granular look at everything that's going in and out of our environments. Everything. And we need to have put in automated controls that gave us the ability to stop something and be not reactionary, but proactive to it. So we can actually drill down and see in our secure model in our platform, and I'll show, that actually talks and gives us the availability. As an example, let's say you have 10,000 physical servers globally today, and there's a security update that has to happen. Can you imagine how long it's going to take to patch 10,000 servers correctly and validate that it was done right? In our model, you patch one instance, you redeploy your application, and it's standard the same across the board. That's real value. The thing up here on the top, you see the relationships I keep talking about all the time, and that's really what this is about, is our whole team, our whole IT organization is really about relationship building now. Because the technologist said earlier, it's, it's the easy part. It's building the trust factor to ensure that when I say to Eric, I'm going to deliver something, that my word is as good as oak and I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do 99% of it, I'm going to do 100% of it. And I'm going to exceed your expectations. And that's how we were successful here. So what is this name? Our cloud platform is called Constellation. And Constellation is our way of delivering an agnostic solution through Amazon, SoftLayer, Google, Azure, VMware, and OpenStack, collectively an agnostic solution that our people can take their workloads and move them any way, shape, or form they want. So when we talk about that and people say, well, I can't really run a multi-cloud strategy, we've proven that wrong. That meaning that we can do it. We have a way to do it today, and we are doing it. We can take pieces of our workflow. I can run some of an Azure. I can run some of an Amazon. And when I need a horizontally scale, it'll automatically scale up. If it costs me too much money, I can move that application to another cloud provider. I can bring it back in-house. That's the power of, of what we've delivered. And then we've put it in the oven, and we've wrapped it and baked it with proactive monitoring and alerts and managed services and automation orchestration that really gives you a value-added proposition to what this model looks like. And I think one of the most inherent things that we actually have to look at is that if you think about a company our size and the amount of compute we run globally is capacity plan. We, we heard somebody before earlier say, <laughs> you're going to run out of space sometime, and that's going to happen. It's happened to us. We've run out of space in cloud providers already, and some of them, where we couldn't fire up resources for a week at a time. So if you're going to be vendor locked in, you're going to have a problem in five to 10 years when the whole world is on this model. 91% of enterprises today are doing something in, around cloud. What are we going to do when, say, the Dallas site runs out seven data centers? I won't name the name of the company, but they're out of space. They have no more capability at all to expand. How are you going to move your workload? How are you going to connect and make those things happen? You need to take an agnostic strategy like we did. Otherwise, I'm fearful for you in five to 10 years that you're going to be without the resources that you need to deliver to your customers. These are our geographical capabilities today. So when we talk about what we have out here in the world today, we've done all this in 18 months. I've been at Technicolor. I started in June of 2014. 
It took us 90 days to figure out what we were going to do. We started building this in November of 2014, roughly. And now here we are in March, and we have a full production-blown system. And every single facility you see here, all the cloud providers, as well as the geographical regions, we, could, we run workloads in here today. Most impactful slide here that I have. We talked about <laughs> the life cycle of automation. How can I make something work and automate it? Well, you think about it, you have to really define, we had to define our requirements, whether it's existing or new. That had to be done. You had to go out and figure out what were we going to achieve? What was the business value we were going to deliver on? So meeting with our stakeholders and, and defining clear-cut results and what that means. And then getting an engagement team together. So I have a small group of people that work collectively to go out and meet with the business units and really get an engagement. So we write a scope of work. We have a deliverable. Everybody knows exactly what's going to happen. Just like you would hire a third-party consultative agreement, we have the same thing in-house today. And what that means is that I have a, we have a small team of DevOps. So develop, who knows what DevOps is? OK, good. All right, so if I'm at half. So we have a small, so we'll take the half of the scale on the left here, the development side. So we will do a development and test around a model. It could be the enterprise architecture team. It could be an insurance policy with a third party provider. It could be the business team themselves that might have the asset to do it. And we create this development situation. And then it goes into our automatic continuous integration and continuous deployment model. Who knows what CICD is? Mm, very few. So CICD is a way of thinking about how do I automate a deliverable and extract that out with, uh, with predictable results? And how, do my, how does my team react in a more efficient manner? So when we talk about tools and services that are around that, if you think about ingesting some code into the front end and automating the outcome of it, and if something happens along the way, you can react in an immediate manner, your teams can now be more successful in delivering that. You've just cut out a whole piece of your infrastructure team that you can now redeploy into more intellectual pieces of your pie. Then that goes over into our pre-release operations, our transmission, our transformation team. They, they engage with the tenant. They engage with the operational team, global operations, to actually transfer this stuff from a development and a UAT alpha beta into real release. And now we go into our production stage, and we're in a monitoring, alerting, engaging with our tenants. And, and the reality of this, everyone, is that we can now collaborate immediately and effectively. Where before we had a development team, we had a sales team, we had a business team, we had an infrastructure team, we had a software, software team, storage team. Now all those people work together in harmony and synergy, so we were one goal, one mission. So our approach and outcomes. There is no way we're going to be able to do this without executive leadership. So Fred Rose, our CEO himself, said, make this happen. Okay, we'll do it. Um, what we did is we did a collection of vision and strategies. So we sat down for a few months period and sat with steering committees and all the business units and developed an actual plan of what that meant. I don't know what happened to the development slide. We got cut off. It looks, looks good on mine. But <laughs> um, and, and, and really, the, the, I said earlier about the one common, one vision, one strategy, one goal. The most important thing for me on here is people. I value the people that work for me. They're dedicated. They're passionate. They wake up every morning at God knows, 5 o'clock in the morning, work 14-hour days because they live, breathe, and eat this. They love it. They want to transform a 100-year-old organization and keep it going. And I think that if you take away from this slide, you look in the traditional model on the left, and now where we are on the right. What does that mean? We just cut out 50% of the responsibilities because we were able to automate the outcomes. Now those people can actually focus on the business and delivering exceeding results to our customers. We also are able to optimize that technology stack so we can look at new ways of making machines smarter, as I said earlier. And then we, as I said earlier, valuing our people. It's, it's so important to me as an individual and in our organization to value our assets because without them, they're, they're the hand that feeds us. We must ensure that we keep delivering and educating and mentoring and guiding them. It's very difficult when you think about someone that's been in an industry and working some, some way for 20 years and you say, hi, I'm Tom. <laughs> I'm going to transform and change what you do. It's not that easy, right? So there's a lot of pain that goes through that process, trust and convincing us that earlier. And I think that Ultimately, for us, that pie chart on the right will get smaller. Um, obviously, I said earlier, security. So as we went through this notion, we have four security groups. We have our content release. We have our AT assessment team. We have our GRC team. And we have our um, uh, IT operations security team. Excuse me. And then we also have insurance policies built now with external vendors that can look at auditing and look at our control mechanisms and our levers that we have in place. So we have five controls that are all independent of each other in our model today. And before, that wasn't like that. It was really one or two. So it gave us even a better granular look, but it created a whole bunch more work for us, right? So it's like climbing Mount Everest. You get to the base camp, you lose half your people because they can't breathe. You get to the next point, you lose 25% more because they lose oxygen. 
and you get almost to the top and maybe you have one or two left with you. And you got to go all the way back down to the bottom of the hill and start the next journey three months later. And that's what it's like. And, and, and when you move into this model like we have, be prepared for 18 to 24 months of that lifestyle because that's what's really the reality of what's going to happen to you. So for us, the realized benefits are pretty clear. So Technicolor is made up of three major business units, entertainment services, which is our production services group, our home entertainment services, our connected home division, which is set-top box, gateway, OTT. Also, I'm sure you read about our Cisco, Cisco acquisition, number one in gateway, number one set-top box now as a company. And then our technology group, which is our IPNL. We operate 45,000 patents worldwide, quite a bit of revenue. And, and all of these things up here really are just that. We wanted to create a resilient architecture that gave us a way to optimize our overall costs. So when I say to a financier, what is your budget for a project? And they say, well, half a million dollars. And I say, well, how are we going to break that apart in different areas? I don't know. Well, let me show you how to do that. Let me show you how to put some of that on premise. Let me show you the metal. Let me show you how to virtualize some of that on premise as well. Let me show you how to put some of that in Google and Amazon, software. So you get the best value from all the cloud providers that we're plugged into. And obviously for us, you know, we all, everybody said this, operate anywhere any place, any time, right? I mean, that's the key for this, right? I mean, obviously, we want to be able to bring all of our data, all of our compute in one location so we can go to the screen emulation, right? If you think about 3270 emulators, that's really where we want to go. And I think next year, that's where we're going to be heading as we move some of our, our relationships and our content creators and our business units start to move all of this stuff into our facilities that I showed earlier on that geographical slide here we will then be able to really deliver a model that exceeds expectations. Thank you very much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you so much, Mark. You definitely don't disappoint. Very fascinating stuff. Um, do we have any questions out here? So I, I, I'll actually start with a question here. Uh, what, what was the, the cornerstone to doing uh, multi-cloud for you guys? Or can you talk about any of that kind of technology? Yeah, sure. Um, for us, it was one, we wanted a future proof or cloud strategy. We wanted to be vendor agnostic. So some of the services that work in Amazon don't work in Google or aren't available, as you know. So hmm. I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll pick on Amazon and Google. Amazon spot fleet price is not like Google's preemptive VM. So if you don't know what spot fleet is, spot fleet is a way for you to bid on wholesale market in Amazon. You can put a range of costs in there, and you can say, well, I, I want to bid 10 cents or 20 cents for this instance, this server. If you're not in that range, you lose it while your workload's running out, happening. In Google, it's a little different. I can guarantee an SLA at the bottom layer up to the top. And now I can culminate those activities together so I can actually run my workload correctly in a, in a stateless form, meaning that I can take some of my, my, my capabilities. So we use a tool called WriteScale today and some of our workloads. And it's, an, it's basically a model that allows us to agnostically move cloud, move between different clouds. So I can take an application stack. So let's say I want to build a bunch of container systems. And I want to put some in, say, Google. And I want to put some in Amazon. And I create this compute infrastructure. I can now take my workload, and I can just drag and drop that into that container system. And it's off and running. So if, if Amazon has an outage, I don't care. I still am running in Google. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what you got to think about, is that your geo pla placement of, of your compute and locking yourself into a vendor. Everybody knows that Amazon's dropped the price like 50 times since 2006, right? But so does everybody else. It's a commodity, right? Don't think about the lower layer. If you think about a house, that's why, right? The basement of a house or the foundation, the stills, the frame, the roof, et cetera, the windows and the doors, right? Everybody does that. Amazon, Google, Azure, they all have those things. But it's the fixtures. It's the couch. It's the color of the carpet. It's how you paint your walls. It's your kitchen sink, right? It's your bathroom fixtures. It's the way your dresser and bed is in your room. Those are the things that make it unique to us, that we wanted to use bits and pieces of all the cloud providers that are out there to deliver something that no one in the market has. And that's what we've done, is we've taken all the best of the breeds and brought them all together and taken bits and pieces to make it work for Technicolor. And in case you didn't catch that, he mentioned containers. Containers is kind of the foundation of what he's talking about. It's something we keep bringing up in this conference. Yeah. So any other questions out here? All righty. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. <laughs>